They said, well, how long have you been coming here? I said, well, I don't know, almost ever since it started. And so I said, so, but I said, and they said, well, why do you come? I said, well, obviously, if I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't come. So I, I really enjoyed coming to this conference because I feel Kevin has somehow managed every year, year after year, to put on a very excellent, uh, really excellent, pertinent conference and this year has been no different. I think he's just really again had a room full of excellent uh, speakers and after hearing Dr. Hamber Bar a few minutes ago I'm um, talking about the hepatitis A epidemic we can uh, begin to appreciate the importance of immunizations because you see many of you in this room remember when we had those 14 diseases that we can now immunize children against, and we don't have them anymore. At least we almost don't have them. And then we get a little slack, and we don't do them, and we get and 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 we start all over again. We think well, we've eliminated them, but then we wake up and discover that they're still very much with us. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the importance of school immunizations. Let like you ask the questions that you may have, and how important it is for the whole community to be involved in immunizations, and if we really want to protect our community, protect ourselves, protect every everyone around and protect our children in what I call the temple of betterment and I call the school our, uh, the temple of betterment and well there's we're sending them there to, to to better themselves and to get an education but we want them to be healthy and safe and protected and we don't want them to go there and get disease and that's what the, we've been about so we can now know that we can immunize or vaccinate children and adolescents from a zero to two for about 14 different diseases and many disease, all of these diseases most of them that we used to have and, and this is that list i remember when we had diphtheria i don't remember much tetanus but i remember seeing tetanus and taking care of tetanus as a doctor and i certainly remember having whooping cough pertussis and it was a very bad disease. And I, mean, I remember babies coming in with babies, seeing whooping cough, and dying. Many of these diseases we don't, we don't think of. Most of you, many of you have never even seen them. But children died with many of these diseases. And they still die in the developed countries. And they did die down in Shaw, Arkansas. And probably a few died in Kentucky, too. We certainly saw a lot of homophilus influenza. That's the cause of much of the otitis media and meningitis that we saw a lot of in children. And you've just heard of just a, just a wonderful talk about hepatitis A and B vaccine. Well, now, you know, we start out immunizing the children before they leave the nursery to try and make sure that they don't end up with hep A. And you've heard what's moms doing the first few year or two of their life. We have a lot of parents who they don't want their children to have HPV vaccine. Well, it's the one vaccine, one cancer that we can immunize children against, HPV. So they said, well, but, but, but Dr. Taylor, is that to make sure that we go out and have sex? I said, well, I said, everybody I know, I said, you can't drive your car unless you have insurance. I said, you don't want to have your house unless you have insurance. I said, you aren't going to go burn your house down. You don't go have a rest. So well, what I'm saying is this was a real big reason. You know, now that we are giving our young men HPV vaccine, so I'm just saying that we had all kinds of excuses built in. All of these, these are in the CDC website and in every doctor's office you walk into and in every health department they walk into and exactly when you when you get them and the reason why many parents don't want them you know sometimes they have to go in and get four and five of them at one time you know they've combined many of them together and the reason why they say oh parent oh my, my baby's too young to be getting five vaccines at a time well you know all they have to do is get whooping cough get polio get measles and get measles and cephalitis. What I'm saying is all we have to do is make sure that parents are aware of what they're, what they're saying 
no to or what they're really reasoning. They aren't getting many of the things. And of course, we're having a new epidemic. We thought we had gotten rid of measles in, in the year 2000. We said that it had been eradicated in the Americas. Well, <coughs> now it's back. It's back because we had pockets of cases c coming over, and we had pockets of unvaccinated people. And of course, we know that now we need to get meningococcal vaccines. This is our 25 year olds going to college. You know, if you're going around a large group, they really need to make sure that they are immunized. We old folk especially, but our young folk need to also get pneumococcal vaccines, and, and well, they're on the immunization schedule. The American College of Pediatrics, the CDC, almost everybody, you know, agrees on the schedule, and it varies a month or two, but it's pretty much the same. And of course, we all know polio vaccine. I, I remember when they had army trucks lined up when we was trying to wipe out polio. I, it, that was uh, even probably before your health commissioner's time. They had the mayors and the army trucks and everything lined up, giving everybody, trying to wipe out polio because it was a bad disease. And I remember we had rooms larger than this room with iron lungs lined up. And you know, doctors, your duty was the iron lung room. So they had pediatricians there, had to stay there full time. You only have to see the crippling disability associated with, to know and appreciate how important it is. And of course, we don't think too much about rotavirus, one of the most common causes of death in, down in the Delta and in Arkansas and in the South. Rotavirus, diarrhea vaccine, so it's important. And of course, we have to give, you know, we have to give several, all of these vaccines, it's not just one time. You know, some of them, you have to give a series of them, like DPT and polio, you get five of those. Two months, four months, uh, six months, 12 months, and another when they're four, and before they go to school. And of course, we have combined the tetanus, and uh, diphtheria vaccine with a, a varicella, you know, chickenpox vaccine. But for the first one, at 12 to 14 months, we usually give that one by itself. But you can give them with the tetanus, but after that, it's usually combined. So these are diseases that used to be common. We used to treat primarily, and we're talking more pediatrics now, right now. We used to treat more acute diseases. Now, 75% of what's taking care of, what we see in medicine, what we take care of in medicine, is chronic diseases, not acute diseases. And of course, you know, most of them are in old folk like me, but we old folk are also getting some of the diseases. And one of the things that we're seeing on our TV at home, they're really recommending that we old folk get, if we haven't had whooping cough, to get whooping cough vaccine, especially if we're around babies, because whooping cough is a horrible disease in babies. So why is it important? Why is school immunization important? First of all, I think it's the one place all children go to school. The parents, they may say, I don't want this and I don't want that. But the one thing all children want is their children to be educated. And so immunizations are important because we're promoting good health. We want, we want to prevent disease. We want to protect our children and other children and ourselves and our community from the diseases that are going on, are going around in that community. And of course, that provides a service. Schools provide services. I, you know, very often, many of the, in old days, many of the immunizations, when we didn't have enough doctors around, they did them at school. They lined, we lined up like all, most of our smallpox immunizations were done at least 
we're talking about, I'm to have to remember I'm from Arkansas and down in the Delta, so, so, don't, so you know, if it sounds foreign. The school nurses came to school and we would just line up and they gave us our immunes, but, but that was the way we got them. You know, we didn't have doctors and nurses and health, you know, we, and we didn't have transportation to get to health departments. The school is an important place for us to make sure that we have, especially for the record keeping. Schools have all of the records and so they know when there are pockets of children that haven't had their immunizations and this is why it's important to keep records and they know who's had and who have had their immunizations. And so school vaccinations requirements help safeguard children and adolescents but making sure they're protected when they get to the temple of betterment that we call schools, and we want them to be protected. And one of the things when 95% of the population is immunized, we have what we call herd immunity. The reason why herd immunity is important is because there are a few children out there that really can't be immunized. Why is it important to vaccinate your child? First of all, you can save their life. You know, you think measles is not a bad disease, but people die. And in fact, world over, almost 100,000 children all over the world, especially in, in undeveloped countries, died in 2017. Secondly, Vaccinations are considered to be safe and effective. And in fact, when you compare, and I'll show you a slide, when you compare the complication rates of the disease versus immunization, there's no question. It's far better to immunize your children. Immunizations protect others you care about. That is, you may not feel well. You don't want your child to immunize, but if you don't immunize them, and then somebody else's child gets sick and die, you still feel bad. And immunizations protect future generations. Think of all the people who died from that list of diseases that I mentioned for you. It decreases or eliminates many diseases that killed or severely disabled people a few generations ago. Smallpox. Polio, rubella. I had rubella when I was an intern at the University of Minnesota. That's a bad disease because I was a doctor. I had these big swollen lymph nodes and I never had a rash and I didn't feel very well, but I wasn't very sick. I was very sick, but think of the pregnant women that was around that I was exposing them to. And what that can do is really cause them to have infants with severe malformations, they have heart defects, they have mental retardation, they have microcephaly, they're severely handicapped. So I'm saying, you may not think it's a bad disease for you. It really can be very destructive to pregnant women who you may not know you've exposed her and she may not know she's been exposed, but her infant has been badly exposed. And we all know that if your child has measles, has contagious disease, you can't send them to daycare. Well, they just don't want them. The doctor don't even want you to bring them to the doctor's office. They'll have to have a safe room. So immunizations, not having this disease, can save time from your family and save dollars. And you've heard how much just one disease was cost in Kentucky and save lost time from work. I mean, so why do we allow exemptions? All states, every state right now, allow exemptions for medical reasons. But we doctors have to be very careful about what we consider medical reasons. You know, if you have a child who has leukemia or has a severe autoimmune disease or has a reason why they can't have immunizations, the reason why you immunize everybody else so that you can protect that child so that they won't get these diseases. 18 states allow exemptions for 
moral or religious reasons, but they're getting very strict and very careful. And they're really, because I, I remember there were people who didn't want to uh, send their children to school. They wanted their home school them. But then they even began to re really requ require even the children that was homeschooled to require that they be immunized. We had people in Arkansas, they would start, a group would get together and start a church and say, well, they don't want their children immunized. So it had to be re a real known religion. Then they have 20 states allow exemptions for philosophical reasons. I don't know what those are, but you know, <laughs> just because the parents don't want them to have them, but you know, it, but if it makes them strong enough, I guess they can end up getting them. And then there's some children with perceived low risk. And of course, vaccine hesitant parents. And of course, many of them feel that their children, because of the herd immunity, well, they don't have to worry about getting their children immunized. Well, then somebody has to get their children immunized. So we have to make sure that we deal with all of that. What are the barriers that are associated? Why do people not comply? Well, they're concerned about the side effects. You know, they'll talk about the side effects of immunization. And they question whether they're effective or not. We've been using them for, I forget how many millions of immunizations. So we know that they're effective and we know that they're safe. That doesn't say that there aren't a few complications and we'll mention those in a minute. And then there are some parents who are concerned that say, well, we don't have the money. They have money for everything else they want, but you know. And then they say children are too young and their body's too immature, you know, so they won't start at birth in two months, four months on the usual schedule. They get off the schedule and then they just kind of never get back on and so they are in, completely immunized. And they say there are too many shots given at the same time. You know, they've combined many of the shots, but now there's still four or five given at different times. So they say there, there are too many shots. They don't want their baby to get that many shots. And they said the pain from injections, well, you know, that lasts, what, a half a minute? And so they, then they move on. And then they think some of the ingredients in the vaccines cause side effects like autism, asthma, and multiple sclerosis. Well, now they've shown that all of the studies that said that were really not well controlled and that those have been shown that's not to be true, so. What can we do to improve compliance? Increase community demand, enhanced access. We've given them to grocery stores, any place that could offer them. That improves compliance, you know, it's easy. And provider-based interventions. They, they may be coming in to see the doctor about something else. Well then, let's give them the shots right now while you're here. Health provider intervention. We were saying the pharmacist has probably given more hepatitis immunizations. Every flu shot I've ever gotten every year was given at the drugstore. Well, we've got to educate our community and make our communities demand that we need to have immunizations. And of course, we talk about the economics. We should make sure that they're free, nearly free, but nobody should not have immunizations because they don't have the money to pay for it. We had a resurgence of an outbreak. We thought that we had gotten rid of certainly measles, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But the reason why we've had resurgence of outbreaks, because of noncompliance, our parents refused to vaccinate. Incomplete vaccination. They'll get two or get one, and they just don't get the rest. Waning immunity. We old folk, we may have got whooping cough vaccine back in the good old days, and now our grandparents and around our grandbabies and all, we might need to make sure we get whooping cough vaccine. And of course, a lot of cases are imported, people coming in from other countries. So that's the cause. So let's talk about measles in the United States. That's what I was told to talk about. Measles virus is one of the most highly contagious human pathogens known. I think you've heard her talk about R0 case. Well, for measles, it's more like 15 to 18. And what that means is that if a room of 100 people and if somebody with measles came in coughing and sneezing, 
15 to 18 of them would end up with measles. So it's very contagious. Since measles immunization was licensed in 1963, the incidence of measles has rapidly declined. It's decreased from 450 cases a year to less than 100. However, we had a resurgence in 2019. Death from measles in 2017 globally was 109,000. Not in the United States. We only had, we had less than 100. This is deaths. This was because people had encephalitis in undeveloped countries. They were just not able to take care of them. We didn't have that many deaths from measles, but we have in the past. From 2000 to 2017, the global incidence all over the world has decreased 83%, and the measles vaccine has prevented 21 million deaths worldwide. And recurrence in the United States is thought to be, we've mentioned already, is due to travel and unimmunized populations. This is the number of cases of measles in the United States reported each year from 1960 to 2019. Well, you can see from 1960 that we had about 400,000 cases of measles. And after the immunization, it dropped down to less than 100. In the insert slide there, where you can see that it stayed there, this very low level, until 20. 14, we had a little peak, we had a little outbreak, and then in 2018, 2019, we had a real peak, and that was primarily in New York. They had uh, cases coming in, so it's a real problem. It's still here. It's not been wiped out, and we thought we had eliminated measles. Well, what do we know? We know the children, to be completely immunized from measles, you need two doses of MMR. One at 12 to 15 months is 93% effective, and in four to six years, it's 97% effective. So it's a good vaccine. But two doses is the standard. Well, some of us, oh, well, have you had measles? As far as I'm concerned, the way you know, if you were born before 1950, you probably have had measles. They don't worry about it. But other than that, you've got to prove you've had measles. You know, most doctors, most of the young doctors, have never seen a case of measles. They have no idea what it looks like, and they don't, they don't even understand it. What are the key manifestations? Well, in measles, you usually have two to four days before you really have manifestations, maybe 12 or 14 days, but before you really have any signs. But you may have cough, fever, coryza, conjunctivitis. That's anything, any flu or anything. But then when you get that rash, and it starts on, usually on about day four, and it starts on the head. It's a macropapular rash that's on the head, and it spreads over the rest of the body. And, well, of course, there is a baby, you can see, with severe rash and has those white, what they call coplic spots. Those are pathognomonic of measles, but we don't see that very much anymore. What are the complications and risks associated with measles immunization? And this is a comparison of the risk associated with me having the measles and the risk associated with vaccination. And well, you can see with the risk associated with me having the measles, otitis media, 8 to 10 percent, pneumonia, subacute panencephalitis is 0.5 to 1 per thousand, and deaths. We don't know how many there are. They think it's probably, it's one per thousand, it's one to 15 per thousand deaths. That was from, from people having measles. Well, if you look from immunizations, the risk for immunizations is less than one per million. Febrile seizures, well, you know, anytime children get immunizations, people will say they get a fever. And thrombocytopenia is one to 30,000. And anaphylactic, it may occur in two to 14 per million.
So what that says, it's rare. We've got to make sure we immunize our children. And if we don't change our direction, we're going to end up where we're headed.